Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to this uh, last SPD seminar of this fall. So we're very happy to have Peter Fritz here today. So um, for those of you who don't know Peter, um, he got his PhD in 2004 at NYU Courant. Um, then he actually went to um, industry for half a year, but luckily he came back and uh, got a lecture position at Cambridge University um, where he also stayed until 2009. Um, then he moved to uh, TU Berlin where he's now um, the Einstein Professor of Mathematics. Um, he's also affiliated with the Weierstrass Institute of Applied Sciences. And um, as you probably know, an expert on a broad range of topics, including um, rough paths, SPDEs, and also quantitative finance. So we're very happy that you're here and that you will give a talk on Laplace and rough analysis. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, full introduction. Uh, I'm happy to uh, talk today on uh, the topic that you already said. I have a bunch of joint authors. Uh, Paul Gassia used to be in Berlin, but now is uh, permanently in Paris. Paolo Pigato, uh, who is still in Berlin, actually I need to update this. He was until recently, he's now in Rome, also on a permanent job. And Tom Close is my finishing PhD student. So, and we are in New York, at least online. Okay, so this will be a, a somewhat a mix. I will start with topics in mathematical finance, and uh, it looks like you know some option pricing talk. But then we move more and more to things that you will eventually recognize as uh, um, you know things that are exactly what you also need to deal with single SPDs. So I'm not having a personal personality disorder, you know, heckle and jide. Um, but these are two aspects of somehow the same thinking. So, okay, I don't have to go to the outline. We'll, we'll see everything anyway. So here's basic finance. I know it's an SPD seminar, but you know, in New York, every person I ever met in New York who does mathematics knew about math finance, at least a little bit. Uh, so a generic Stockwell model would be written in this way here. So, so DS over S, and then you have your your volatility and here's some brown in motion. And if you take this sigma process here, the ball process, if you take the constant, then that's called the Black-Scholes model and we have assumed zero rates and dividends. So, I mean, this smells like, you know, if this is constant here and at the end of the day, everything is a, you know, a perturbation if you want of Black-Scholes. Uh, this is basically a brown in motion. So it's very natural to switch from S to log S. There's some E to correction, but essentially, that straighten things out until you, you're back to Brownian world instead of a, you know, looking at geometric Brown motion. So here's the log price, called it X. And then there's this, you know, strike and capital K and the log strike little capital D. So in option pricing, this is the 101 of, of you know, financial mathematics. You have here essentially the asset price here written in this log language, but exponentially X is the asset price. And then here's the, the strike price, essentially capital K. And this is the, the payout, I mean, under the, some, some pricing measure, this is the value of some European call option. Then you can do the same with put options if you want, and that looks like this. Okay. Now, if you don't, if you're not into finance, then don't worry, it's, it's okay. You can, I'll show you in this picture here that it's, you know, that there's meaning without finance. So here, down here, this was the, the call option world. And let me just tell you, if you're on this black show setting, then you know everything. You know that, that the log price has a normal distribution. And again, here's the eta correction and the variance, you know, if you run into time little t, sigma squared t, et cetera. So you know what the, the PDF of this is. And then if you just, you know, compute this expectation by integrating up this, you know, this payoff and here it is. And this is again, elementary probability theory. And there's something else called digital option. And the payout is just, you know, you get $1 or euro. If your price is, is above some level and you get nothing below. And of course this has the, the immediate interpretation probability theory as somehow a tail probability, you know, what's the probability that your process is above some level. And if you, you know, step down one more on this ladder here, you take one more derivative, little k if you want, then you go to, to somehow, you know, you just get something if you write up bang on it, otherwise nothing. So it's like a Dirac payoff. So it's a bit formal here, but the, 
you know, here you have just have the density. Okay, so you can go all this the other way around to start from density and to integrate up, you integrate again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So knowing all the call options, the call option prices for all case basically tells you what the law is of this random variable x at time t. But here's just a Gaussian example here. Okay. And in that case, you can compute, well, I mean, you can write down integrals, but if you're interested in say small timers and dot x, then you see you can compute this. It's some calculus exercise. I'm not trying to take away the fun from you trying this by, by hand in this, you know, at night if you want. So the leading order term here, you know, what happens? So, so K is the, let's say this, the, the, the log strike. And so things have been normalized. If K is zero, it's at the money. If K is positive, it's out of the money. So you know that, you know, for K positive, think K positive, uh, this just goes to zero. This all, everything goes to zero. But how does it go to zero? Well, in some diffusive model, it goes exponentially fast to zero. And here's this leading order term. And, you know, you all recognize this, I hope, from large deviations. Okay, so there's the leading order factor. But the interesting thing comes, or let's say the, the more subtle thing is when you zoom in what happens when you go beyond, beyond large deviations. And so here are the next order terms and you see here's T to the minus half, the people call it algebraic in T. Then here's the next one, here's the next one. So you can see, I'm sorry for this pop-up window. So you can see a pattern here in the powers of, of T. And then there are some factors that stand around depend on K. Uh, it's getting, well, if nothing else, it's getting complicated, even in the Gaussian setting. So now why bother, why bother? Well, you will see answers to this question throughout uh, the next slides. So let's make things more complicated because uh, we don't want to end at Black Shore. So we look at the classical Stockwell model, the one I had in the very beginning, and let's put some sort of Markov structure in it. And let's assume you have the you know, you can write it in this way here, where this is some multidimensional Brownian noise. Here's some, you know, volatility matrix and, you know, some, some drift vector field. And we want to think of it, again, small time. So there's a small time horizon we're looking at, zero T. And now we, we just rename T and we call it epsilon square. And instead of T to zero, we said epsilon zero. And then of course you can use Brownian scaling and say, you know, instead of looking at this one on a small interval of size epsilon, square, we switch to unit time interval, but we scale down the noise. So we turn the uh, small, the short time problem into small noise problem. So it's a classical trick. And if you do this, then you have a very particular form here that this epsilon square comes in. Of course, you can study more generally the small noise problem in its own right, and then it doesn't have to be epsilon square. But if you come from short time, you have this epsilon square here. So again, this is just a consequence of Brownian scaling. All right, so, I mean, the point is, you know, use Brownian scaling, you have this in law here. Again, you move from a short time problem, so xt with t small, you move to a small noise problem, time one, but with this, you know, vanishing diffusivity governed by epsilon. All right, large deviations. So what do we know about large deviations? Well, we just put a few reminders here. So this is a very classical, result here that uh, if you look at somehow tail probabilities, so, you know, you have a situation like this, what happens when you take epsilon to zero? Well, everything goes to zero here. So if you start in addition at, at zero, then this goes to zero very strongly. So when I mean, we've talked about this before, at least in the Gaussian setting, and this is true general as a consequence of friedland wenzel theory, but you have this somehow in this large deviation regime. Uh, and that means this twiddle here means, uh, in the asymptotic sense. So if you take the log on both sides, then you have an asymptotic equivalence. And, you know, this is in terms of epsilon, but at the end of the day, if you, you know, if the problem was short time, you can go back and reformulate it in terms of T if you want. Right? Remember, T equals epsilon squared. That will be true all the time. Okay, well, there are a few names. This capital lambda here is called the energy or rate function. And if you go one more time back to Black-Scholes, then you can of course compute this energy and this is just a Euclidean energy or Euclidean distance squared and there's some scaling that has to do with the, you know, with how you stretch it using your Black-Scholes wall. I mean, this induces a, a stretched, you know, Euclidean geometry. Okay. There's something neat here, at least I think it's neat. Uh, if you match up this guy here, 
okay, this guy here. And you compare it with the same quantity you have in Black Scholes, but that's here, okay. So in Black Scholes, of course, your sigma here is constant, but you can think in terms of implied sigma, the implied volatility, so which is the effective one that has the same effect, okay, let's call it sub i. It's a bit quick here. That's a nice heuristic. And you equate this guy here, hop, with this guy here, but now you allow sigma to depend on k and t, and also t goes to zero. Then you, you know, you can sort of guess this equivalence here, and that's the Berestiki Busca Ferrand formula that was proved uh, you know, rigorously with PD methods in a CPAM paper in 2004, and people have rederived it in, in different settings. Okay. So that's that's pretty. This is the again Berestiki Busca Ferrand. This this convergence, I can write it as a plus little O of one, it's the same thing. And let me just, for the sake of good measure, spell out what is the rate function. Of course, in general, you can't write it down, but it has some large deviation type variational formulation. So it's the, the you know, you look at all admissible, you know, camera Martin drivers that do the right thing. And the right thing is, you know, you take, go back to your dynamics here. So job, job here, dynamics, okay. And now you replace this guy here by dh or h dot dt and h dot is an L2 function. And when time, you know, this one you can ignore. So this is somehow the, the, the I mean, the, the control problem on the skeleton. So, and this is the guy that you need to, to feed in here. I should make this one bold. So this is this control map. You have to run this to time one. And again, you have to insist that it does the right thing. You have to get to this target level K. Right? And then you look at the cheapest way of doing so. You take the infimum over all h in w1, 2, and voila, this is the rate function. And now this is just a rephrase. Okay? So there's a geometric interpretation of this. This is, if you like, Riemannian geometry. This is uh, some high point subspace square distance. Okay? I mean, this is also is very intuitive from a, from a financial point of view that um, if you're very close to the money and you also doing short time asymptotics, there's nowhere your wall can go. So locally, it's like you freeze the spot wall and you back to black shoals. So that's leading order as expected. Okay. So two questions. One is, can you say more? And I will tell you later why this, I think this is an important question. And here, of course, this is Perestiki Busca Florent. It's a great formula, it just has the the downside, you need to be able to compute this energy here. And there's some models where you can do this and then they have a famous name when you can like the Sabre model. But in general, you have, you know, this is a, you know, it is what it is, but can you go beyond? Okay, we'll come to that. And the second question is, what happens when you go, you know, beyond these Markovian models that we just looked at? I mean, this is, you know, Markov diffusion models, and Wenzel is all classical stuff. It's nice, you can apply it here in this financial context. But there's a new class of models where the wall process is not just one component of some high dimensional or high dimensional Markovian diffusion process, but instead it may be just, a, I mean, this is a model case, a function that has some fractional scaling as a process, like a fraction bound motion. And here, you know, there are many different fraction bound motions you can write down, but in this context, this Prima Liouville fraction bound motion is somehow for good reasons popular. And so, the interesting new thing, I mean, new means now five years, is that this fractional power motion is somehow rough. That means h is less than a half and not bigger than a half, which would amount to somehow a trending, I mean, um, you know, uh, a trending volatility process. So this one is just fluctuating, fluctuating like crazy. Okay. I'm not going into this Gatherell Rosenbaum stories. Why, I'm, if you're interested in finance, you've heard this. Otherwise, you know, take it on face value that this has been big business in finance. So, question three: numerically useful. And so, why would that be uh, an issue? Well, you should worry about this one. If you go from a diffusive scaling to a, a fractional Brownian scaling here, and h is small. Right, and you want to, you know, what you know is, I mean, the, what you're considering is short time asymptotic. So t is small, and that's great. And if t is small, then the square root of t is still reasonably small. But 
if your h happens to be you know very close to zero then then this may not be that small after all so you may be worried about the quality about your summations and i should start watching the time here because there's a lot to say and the time is ticking okay so let me give you a partial a few uh, you know pointers to the past but uh, i want to go quickly on this part so so in a classical heston model people love this model uh, you can compute many things here so i give you a few names here let me not go into detail but let me just say that this next term, this is the question I pose, is actually uh, known. So you do get a T here. So, I mean, remember this whole thing here was a little O of one. So the, the first term is of order T and then plus little O of T is at, at least not shocking. And then people were able to compute this as a function of K. And there are long, I mean, several papers in fact, where they make a case, you know, how this affects the numerics and it's all good and, and dandy. Okay. so. Uh, mathematically, these two problems are equivalent. So understanding the asymptotics of the implied wall is equivalent to the understanding of these core price asymptotics. Once you know one, you can somehow, uh, it's not trivial, but there's a general way of, of go doing it. And it has to do with understanding the Black-Scholes formula really. And there's a, a very nice paper by Gao Li, where they have done this in, in great generality. Uh, you know, refining previous works, including myself with Benaim, where we looked at the large deviation order, the tail wing formula from, from the old days. Okay, but so the, the upshot here is, here's this call price, this expectation we talked about earlier. And if you're able to, to you know, nail down here, here this large deviation exponent, this energy, if you understand this one, well, this this governs the implied wall leading order, this is Perestiki Buskeflora. But then if you understand this constant here, there are mechanical ways to go here. So you won if you're down, if you know, if you got that. Okay. So who looked at this? Well, a uh, number of people, good people, Kazuka, Osajima, uh, Osajima again. And they found that this factor here is, you know, three half. Again, if you remember the Black Scholes uh, example, that's not shocking, but they could compute this at least for small k and uh, okay. Keep going. Uh, here's the problem is intermezzo on rough volatility. Uh, Gather Rosenbaum. Well, I promised you not to talk about this, so now I do. Okay. So, a series of papers. And again, the take home message is that H is small here. At least many authors make this case. And if you're in finance, then, you know, there's always a tale about two measures. You always have to ask people, you know, are you looking at the, at the, the market, the, the sort of the physical measure or some pricing measure? And the, you know, the questions then are different and the answers are different. And so they looked actually on the statistical measure and found the physical measure and found that H is very small by looking at time series and then Fukasawa read it analysis. And, and so there's, there's some agreement. And on the other side of the, the you know, this, this measure story on the pricing measure side, for different reasons, this, this H was also uh, be taken I mean, it was seen to be advantages to take, uh, to beneficial to take H small. So there's great consensus, uh, uh, let's say in the math finance community that H small is a good idea. Okay, more references, more names. Um, but let me go to the questions here. So we talked about large deviations in, in these Markovian models, a la Freidlin Wenzel. And so next question is what would you do in rough wall? And then once you have large deviations, can you get precise asymptotics? And if so, how? Well, answers. The first answer is actually by two guys, Martin Forde, and uh, there's a, a second author. I know he was in Colombia. I'm not sure he still is, and I've never met him, but it's a very nice piece of work. And so what they look at is this uh, so-called rough volatility model where the, the vol process, I mean, this is just a funny way of, you know, writing, writing a correlated Brownian motion. So let me spend one second on this because I don't want to lose you over this. So if your rho is your, your correlation parameter and the rho bar is the usual square root of one minus rho squared, then this here is just a scalar Brownian motion. But by construction, I mean, you guess, I hope that W and W bar are two independent Brownian motion. And what you did here is you constructed a correlated Brownian motion, one that is correlated with this first factor W exactly with rho. And so this first factor W here, this Brownian factor, is the one that you use to build this fractional bound motion. Okay, let me go back here, up, up, up here. You give me W, 
then you write down this eta integral and out comes wh. This is one way of constructing a strong construction of fraction bound measure. So this is just to get the correlation parameter in, which is you know in the in the at least the equity pricing world quite uh, fundamental. If you take it to zero, that's a very bad thing to do. Okay, but the maths is you know for the maths it's not uh, actually zero would simplify quite a few things. We don't want to do that, but you could take it minus one as an extreme case to minimize your notation. The maths would be more or less the same. So where are we? We do the first trick from, well, the first thing, again, we try to turn the small uh, short time problem to small noise problem. So we do the same scaling because, you know, we want to turn this guy here to get an epsilon out and, and here it happens. I mean, in fact, there's an epsilon here, another epsilon here because we have two brown motions, no problem. But here something happens because we have a fractional brown motion the scaling is different. We get out epsilon to this fractional, I mean, this is parameter 2h. And so if, if you're in a Brownian setting, of course, h equals a half, then this is just one, and that's the previous situation. But now h is not a half, it's less, perhaps much less than a half. So we have to do something, and we, in that case, means for the term. And what they realized is there's a simple trick to do it. We have to rescale. We just have to, you know, if you want to think in terms of, of uh, contraction principle, friedel Wenzel you would like to have this guy here and this guy, they should run at the same scale because everything somehow is a function of this Gaussian noise. And then you can think at least formal at the contraction principle. And to make this happen, what you have to do is this, right? So you divide off the epsilon you don't like, you multiply with the epsilon 2h that you do like. And then, you know, you see here, I introduce a new speed here, epsilon r is the epsilon 2h. So in terms of this epsilon r, I have now everything in the same scale on this scale epsilon r. And so now I can say this guy here, right? I mean, if you disregard some, some technicalities with eta integration, it's a function. I mean, it is a function, it is a measurable function of the rescaled noise. And the noise here is, well, okay, it's the Gaussian noise that you see. Okay. So what you can say then is, well, you know. I, I can say something not about the original log price, that's this one, but I can say something about this rescaled option price process, okay? So here's the one where the large deviation, at least formally, I expect to work. So I have this, you know, think contraction principle. This will be, you know, the usual large deviation factor, exponential minus energy divided by, here's the speed function, hop. And then you can, you know, you can spell it out in terms of h if you want. And if you want to check that h equals a half gives you the, the previous epsilon square, you can and it works. But, you know, this was somehow a fake quantity. So let's translate it back to the, the guy you're interested in. And that was the, the real log price. And so there's a price you pay here. This scaling here has an effect that you, you know, let's call x the, 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 the strike here. This strike here is now hit when you substitute this in. You know, you have to take this factor to the other side and there's a different, this X turns into a different quantity that depends on epsilon. So let's call it K epsilon. Could have called it X sub epsilon, but I think K is a bit prettier. And here's the relation here. So you have an extra factor here that comes exactly from here. Right? So what happens? Well, remember H is less than a half, that means that this guy here goes to zero. Okay, that's not so bad actually, because that means that your strikes that you're looking at, I mean, epsilon, you know, epsilon is the square root of time. We're looking at short time problems and this epsilon helps us to do that. So we are forced to look simultaneously at short time and somehow strike regimes that, that accumulate at the money. This is not a stupid thing to do at all, because if you think of the, the liquid, um, you know, option price data in the short end, they will accumulate close to the money anyway. So this is not a, such a bad thing after all to look at. Uh, it's a bit remiss, reminiscent of moderate deviations. Well, here that's that's not true. This is just large deviations, but let me show you what I mean here. So let's, let's do again a Black-Scholes type example here. But let me do it with a twist. So black shoals, there's no rough wall, of course, all is Gaussian. So let me try this here. So this is my usual black shoals. Here's my constant sigma. Then, the, you know, the drift, we can ignore, forget the drift. Um, 
And now make a little twist here that this kt, okay. Well, I mean, this kt is the same as you know, up. Abuse notation a little bit. If I write kt or k epsilon, the relation epsilon square and, and t is, is hardwired, okay, for the whole talk. So I can turn this into into again now a problem in, in terms of epsilon. So let me put in this epsilon. So what I see here, right? I mean, this is really um, sigma squared times epsilon squared if you make this so that by scaling the sigma epsilon comes out. I have a standard normal here. And then this guy here was by definition this guy here. So I can do the power counting on epsilon and see what I get. I get this here. And why I set it up, I set the problem up here to make this epsilon to the 4h appear. I put this in by hand, okay? But the advantage is I, I put it now on this scale here that allows me to play the same matching game that I did earlier. Because here, right, this was just, I mean, this is what I got from an honest large duration somehow analysis. And now here, I, you know, I forced it in by putting in this extra factor here. It was my choice that my, you know, my log strike here runs at this, at this level here, right, at this rate. And this rate was chosen exactly to make this 4H appear here. I can make it disappear if I put an H equals one half, this whole thing disappears and I'm back here to the epsilon squared. It was on slide three today, but now I twisted it for purpose to make this 4H appear. Why? Because it's the same in 4H here. And now you match the, the, the exponents again. And what you get here is again, this BBF formula, but now in a setting of rough volatility. And the price you pay is here. It's not your fixed, you know, your fixed uh, log strike anymore. That used to be the same X is here, X here, X here. But now here you run. This is this one, okay? So this is how you have to tweak the PBF formula to make it work. But again, I'm explaining to you work that's not mine at all. This is for the sun. So, okay, then you can do more, more context, more names. I think I will skip this. Uh, other than this. Today, our prototypical rough wall example will be the one from for the sun. On this slide, I'm just making you know, a statement here that there are several other models with rough wall that are popular, rough Heston very much, rough Bergomi very much, but our toy example for the rest of today is this uh, for the Zhang model. So you just impose that your, your wall process is a function of your fractional brown motion, okay? Everything I'm saying can be adapted to rough Heston, rough Bergomi if you want to, but the, the key ideas I explain in this, uh, you know, model example. Okay. Um, there is something that you can say about this. Uh, okay. I mean, we talked about somehow, you know, this large deviation. There's a close relation between these tail probabilities here and actually the, the call prices themselves on the large deviation level. I don't want to talk really much about this. So let me skip this. And here's the result. And I can be a bit more specific now. So this has a journal. So Peter, I think there's a question in the chat. So is sigma decreasing or rho negative typically? Is sigma decreasing? Sorry, which sigma? Is this referring to this equation here? Uh, Shilion, can you uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? No, so yeah. So I'm just asking, so, so typically you expect, you know, a positive correlation between like spikes of volatility and like, you know, decrease of price or vice versa. So this correlation parameter, this one, rho, yeah. that's a, well, it's also here. So that's a toy problem we're talking about this one. So this rho is a fixed parameter. The analysis here, um, it would be boring if I take it zero, okay? Yeah. And certainly implications, you don't want it zero, but it's a fixed parameter throughout the, you know, throughout the talk, throughout the paper. Uh, usually people take it close to minus one, at least in equity. So I'm not trying to tell a story how to choose this or, or to make it move or anything. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. 
Okay. So of course, it's a good question. How does rho affect this, the shape of your smile, you know, which is governed to first order by this one? So these are all interesting questions, but this is not the, the context uh, or the content of my talk at all. Okay. Thank you for your question. Okay. So I was about to, okay, this to appear in AP20, but okay, who cares? Um, so there's some mild integrability condition that you need to deal with European talks. If you don't like it, you do puts instead. And, uh, but so what is the result? I think it's a nice one. You get this leading order factor, this large deviation factor that we have seen before. So no surprise. And then you get this whole refinement. And what you may or may not remember is on the first few slides today, we looked at the Black-Scholes examples. And so that, you know, essentially can think H equals one half. And so this one turns into three. And in terms of time, this is T to the three half. We've seen this in the Black-Scholes example, okay? And then there was some mysterious constant. I, I don't think I even wrote it down. And so we can actually spell out what it is here uh, before we get too excited. The, the, the expressions here, I mean, you can, you know, dig into, drill into models and, and work out what they are and at least, you know, say what it is when X is small, which is, you know, which is close to the money. So you can further analyze this, this thing here, but it's by no means an easy, an easy expression, I don't think. Okay, but that is it. So this is as epsilon goes to zero, epsilon to, uh, to zero, sorry. There's a cool software, by the way, it's called TechMess. Okay. So I will tell you about something about the proof here, but not immediately. A few remarks here. So this was for calls, you can do it for puts. Uh, you need a non-degeneracy assumption, which is always satisfied for small x. So if you know Riemannian geometry, uh, it's a little bit of saying that the, um, there's, uh, the cut locus does not meet the diagonal, if that means something to you. So this is somehow, the, the, there's a similar reason here why this worked for small x. But again, the, in the proof you see it, so it's not very illuminating unless you know a lot of geometry. So as I said earlier, this works by Gao Li, for instance, allow you to translate this expansion here up directly into allow you to translate this expansion. What's going on here? Okay, we're back on track. So you can take your expansion and get a corresponding expansion of the implied volatility, which is what practitioners care. And you have this leading order BBF term and then the next term is t to the 2h. And so again, if h is a half, which is the diffusion case, you have this t here that I've shown you earlier, at least in the HEST model. And there's some uh, you know, explicit term here. Again, you can say more about it, but I don't want to torture you. You can also check that this is correct in the Black-Scholes model. And we go back to slide four and check that it all works out. And it's of course uh, satisfying and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, now, how, how, do, how do you go for this? How can you prove this? Or, or perhaps differently put, um, I mean, the, the results I'm presenting here are new and our proof rely on regularity structures or at least you know, some, some ramifications of rough paths that are halfway between rough paths and regularity structures. Uh, but before we go there, I'll, I'll show you uh, how you just get the large deviations. So you don't need regularity structures to do large deviations. You can do it by, I mean, it's some basically stochastic integral with a funny structure. So if you discretize and you know, you're know you careful, then you'll get there and you do. This is basically the, the Ford et Zang paper. But let's let's take this, this, you know, this view here that we had a few slides ago, let's take it literal. So this Ito integral is a function of the rescaled noise. So if this, map, it's some sort of an Eton map. I mean, it's a simple situation. That's a good thing. You see everything. If this Eton map were continuous, then you, you know, it's 
you have LDP for the Gaussian noise. It's basically a Schilder type theory uh, result. Contraction principle, you're done. But you can't follow this path because this map is not continuous. It's, you know, it's an honest stochastic integral. So, so you know, even if the H is one half, it wouldn't help you. There's something, you know, between the two independent brown motions, you would have Levy areas sitting in there. It's, it's complicated. And then you have H on top, there's a convolution of the noise. So this is not going to be a continuous image of, of some Brownian noise, not at all. So, but what we can do at the price, there's a little bit of a price to pay. You need a little bit of regularity for sigma. If you think in, in the application terms here, financial mathematics, sigma, you know, it's, I mean, in the rough Begomi model, you take it to be an exponential function. So in terms of regularity, it's smooth, but, but you know, there may be a lot of growth, but local regularity is not an issue at all. And so this is what the theory requires, a bit of local regularity, and we surely have it here. So the point, the point of rough paths of regularity structures is that such stochastic operations are often continuous images of the noise provided you, you know, you make it a little bit bigger. It's called the enhanced noise or it's called the rough path or it's called the model. So let's see how it looks like here. So here are two brown emotions. So back in the days, you know, think Terry Lyons, you would have had, I mean, the beginning of rough paths, there would have been no H shade. You would have looked at W and, and W H bar. And again, this is essentially Levy area. And then you would try to say something about this. Now here it's a bit different, right? Because um, even if you forget this for a moment, this W bar, I mean, there's an extreme case that is perfectly interesting to look at. I gave recently a lecture at ETH where I did everything in the setting. You can take your row equals minus one. So what happens is that your row bar vanishes and then you can forget about this W bar. So it's a one factor stochastic ball model. A bit like the old model that Chris Watch has proposed. So this is you know, perhaps not even that important. That guy is, is sort of curious, right? If H would be one half, then W is just, WH is the same as W, right? This, there's nothing happening. And then you can say, oh, I know, I use Eta's formula and I realize this is one half W square minus, you know what you know. So I can robustify this term in case that H is a half. But the moment that H is not a half, I can't do this. This is just, you know, some Eta integral, whatever it is. Okay, so I have no choice here than taking this with me as building block. This becomes part of my you know, rough pass, but not rough pass in the sense of a definition in, in some of the books, but it's a rough pass in philosophy. And so if you, if you look for the right name in the literature, I mean, you realize it's actually an example of a model in the sense of Martin Hira. So, and then depending on how rough you are, so that depends on your age, and again, age is small, you may need more building blocks. And where do these building blocks come from? Well, you know, in the end of the day, rough pass and even regulatory structures is all about Taylor expansion. So you have to do, you know, local expansions of this. This is where the smoothness of sigma comes in. And then you need your building blocks ready. And the building blocks are here. Here's the first one, here's the second one. Then keep going. And for good measure, I have also reminded you there's a W bar here. But if you're happy with that, that example that I gave you that you take rho equals minus one, and then these would literally disappear. So it would be even simpler, okay? So now, if you get, Okay, so let's agree this is called somehow a rough pass or model. And if you get the large deviations right for this enhanced noise, of course, in the right space of rough pass or models with the right topology, if you get the large deviations right for this object, then you're done, right? Because then it's plain sailing with contraction principle to get your large deviations, pathwise, of course. Okay, it's easy. And I mean, you have to do it in, uh, with the right speed function, of course, but this was, you know, preliminary massaging of the problem. So in the paper, we actually, you know, the paper is not at all about, about this one toy model. So we, we make a few abstract assumptions that are satisfied in all the examples we know. And so we just make the assumption that this is actually, uh, that the, the, you know, the rescaled log price here is actually a continuous map in on some model space. Here it is. So we had this rate function before, this doesn't change anything. And now uh, there's, there's an assumption, I need to watch the time here. I'm halfway done, but my time is, you know, three quarter over. Um, 
when you want to do somehow a Laplace method and you have too many minimizers and they form a continuum, then, then it's a bit of a trouble. So let's make the assumption here that you have a unique non-degenerate minimizer. Okay, I mean, I can assume what I want in life, but this is not a crazy assumption here because when I'm at the money, that means X is zero, then there's nothing to do. I can just work with the zero control path that has energy zero and it doesn't get any cheaper. And this is trivially the, the unique non-degenerate minim, uh, the unique minimizer. And so uh, you can check by by hand if the spot was positive. It's also non-degenerate. And this non-degeneracy, this unique non-degeneracy or uniqueness plus non-degeneracy is actually an, an open condition. So if it's true at, at the one point in that case x equals zero at the money, it's true in a small neighborhood. So. So it's a good assumption. I mean, you have to make it as an assumption, but in the end, it's you check it in your applications. Otherwise, it's not a good theory, of course. And so, what's the idea of the Laplace method? And that, I mean, this goes back to uh, Asincourt, Benarus, Bismuth. I mean, this is the you know the, the heydays of stochastic analysis in in um, in France, but also with Stroke and, uh, and co-workers in the US and AIDA and, and Kuso. So, so this was big business in the 80s, 90s. And so we, we transfer it to this new world. And again, there have been other works in the setting of, of rough paths before. So we also didn't start totally from scratch here. But what's the idea? So here is something that's plain abuse of notation. W is not a Brown motion. W is a whole, you know, sausage. That involves brown motion and you know extra gadgets that you need to robustify. So, and then epsilon times. What does that mean? Well, this should really be understood as a dilation, where you get every double you get is its own power here. So, so this would you know I would have to amplify it with epsilon cube and this one with epsilon square, etc. So this is a very bad way of writing it, but it's a short way. So. So it's the right way of scaling this enhanced noise. And this one is even worse. It's I'm just you know, adding something brutally here. So the correct terminology is translation of, you know, of rough bars or of dilated rough bars or of models. And so what you should think of is pretend for a moment that your W is smooth, which is not such a good idea in the end because here's either, but pretend. And then you just replace every occurrence of W by epsilon w plus h, then you see formally what happens, and that gives you a clue what I mean here. So, but you know, fear not, you can you can probably define all this, but it takes more space and time than I, I'm willing to spend here on this topic. Okay, so now if phi here, this is the solution map, but remember, as 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 a map on rough path space, this is actually a nice map, unlike the Ito map. So. You can expect very good properties, including this one. Well, so for epsilon bar actually zero, you know, the, you just sit wherever you are. This is the, the, the this is the path that the cheapest path that gets you where you want to be. And then you see what happens when you, I mean, it's like a little bit taking direction derivatives here in directions of the noise here. Up. So this would be, you know, if you randomize it and then make your W. Gaussian, this, this is actually in the first chaos, and here and then he would pick up things that are at most in the second chaos, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a remainder. Of course, the remainder is usually the, the big pain because this sticks out in all the chaos directions. So if you do classical Laplace method in Wiener space, this is always a troublemaker, and you have no good control, and the diagrams are very subtle. But here, okay, I'll, I'll tell you more in a second here. So what happens next with the Laplace method? You have this. This good path here, this minimizer. This is the one, you know. So conditional on getting to this point x, you know, it has to happen somehow, you know, along this minimizer hx. So we do the obvious thing, we do a Gesanov transform. And what happens is that there's this Gesanov factor with the stochastic integral, blah, blah, blah. And so this red term here, this is the, the compensating guy in the Gersanov exponent. This explains your large deviation, but of course that's too quick of an argument because uh, you know you could put any h in a Gesanov transform and you would get anything out of here. So it must somehow be crucial that this hx is the minimizer, and there's a first order optimality condition that will take care of this to cut the integral as a constellation here. So this is actually this what I'm just saying here uh, requires a little proof, but it's really a first order optimality condition that tells you that this eta integral here 
actually relates to this expansion that we have seen here. This G1 here, you may or may not remember, this is this guy here. Up. Okay, first, so do you have an explicit expression for this G1 or G2? Yes, yes, you do. Because, I mean, in our example here, I can write out very explicitly what this is, right? Here it is. Okay. Okay. Well, with a, with a little fantasy. Okay. This is my my ETO map here. So, okay. It's sort of a, a sewing limit of your building blocks. So I can't, you know, get, go do too much. Well, actually, I will show you on a later slide. I will show you a little bit more. So yes, you can't write it down, but you have a very good understanding of that map. I mean, this is what you know, rough paths and, and regulatory structures is all about. So you have a good understanding of this, yes. Okay. Um, right. So here's another general fact on this Laplace business that once you have a unique minimizer, you localize. And the whole asymptotics, the, you know, everything you compute in the end of the day, it all comes from a delta neighborhood, any fixed delta of the minimizer. Okay, so if that you know classical Laplace method on on Venus space, you would basically look at some epsilon sausage around your your camera Martin path H X, and now it's sort of the same, but we are not in the classical Venus space, but we are working on rough path space, so so the the topologies are somehow much uh, much uh, uh, more stringent. Okay, so but the there's a general principle that works, the proof works just the same, that if you have the large deviation principle, okay, and why do we have it? Well, you have to do once and for all the work that your lifted model, which is somehow lives in finitely many Wiener Ito chaos, that there we have a large deviation principle. And do you? Yes, you do, because this is general facts on, on Gaussian measures and Gaussian chaos will we'll get to that. Okay, and then you have a continuous map. So LDP basically comes for free. And we do the localization now in this lifted path space or model space and the large deviations we have there allow us to do the the minimum uh, sorry the localization okay so we do localize and we localize not in a, in a silly path space but we, we localize in a in this you know really rough path or model space in this very strong halter type uh, uh, metrics and the good thing is that once you work in these in these rough path type spaces, you get actually, and this is the big benefit of rough path, you get a very nice control over this remainder. So I said earlier, if you're in a stochastic setting, you know it's it's rather subtle to to control this guy. But in a, if you think of if you take a rough path perspective, then suddenly you have good estimates for this guy. Okay. At the price of moving to this bigger noise space. So I said there were other people looking at, at such ideas in, in a rough path context uh, before us. Uh, so here are some names, Aida, Inahama, Kavabi. I mean, there, there was a whole series of, of papers, maybe 10 in total or more GFA, good papers, good people, uh, recent applications to heat kernels on the cut locals. And so it's, it's good fun. Okay, so here's my promised uh, example where you see it explicitly. It's called the, the fractional Stein-Stein model. And it's a very simple affine choice here. You know, your wall process is a function of your fraction bound motion, yes, but it's an affine one. So in that case, you can really write it down, right? Here it is. If you think, you know, the, the model was basically an Ito integral of this guy here, but then you plug it in, what you get is Gaussian part, and then you get these explicit, very explicit integrals. And there's a typo here, it should be a W. Up. So, this is one of the cases where you get this explicitly. You can just write it down, right? This is it. So I'm putting under the table some uh, this uh, you know ETO correction that that you get from the log price, but it's totally irrelevant. So so this is really it. Okay, and because of that simple structure here, you don't have to do the sewing. So if you have a more general function of my noise here, I would have to fire up some local steering or reconstruction organites to write it down. But in this simple case, I can basically 
spell it out globally as a function of a, as a linear combination of my building blocks. So that's very special, but that happens in fact in Steinstein. And now you can amuse yourself to walk through this, um, this construction, this special case here. And I say also something here about more general. So what, what is when you move you know, to more general Fs here? So in this case, F was F fine, but now it's some general F. What would happen? Well, again, you need to, to use Sewing rough path, rough hierarchy construction, you name it. But so why does it work? Why do you get this good control? You can see it very nicely here. So let's try here that you have a, a cubic power. So this is, well, you see something here. Let's do H a half just to see that the computation is somehow explicit because now we can play around with E2 tricks and you can compute this guy actually. I mean, if you think about it, if you take this here cubic, okay, what's going to happen here, then you can just apply Ito's rule, right? So if this is cubic, then this is somehow of order four in the noise. So, so there's something here, order four, and there's some Ito correction. And I, I checked once and all my coefficients, coefficients were correct, but I'm not checking now for you again. And so what's the problem with this is this one here, right? This, this sounds like it's terrible because uh, you have this, um, you know, you want this to be, I mean, we talked about remainders here and you would, you would like it to have exponential moments at least. And so this, this doesn't look very good, but remember the localization. The localization is, here is my, so we shifted already everything with the Gersanov in the neighborhood of, of zero here. And so my localization, my, my delta sausage, if you want, is amounts exactly to say, to enforcing that my rescaled noise is somehow is somehow rho, not that, rho small. And so what does this mean? That, that means that I can take off of these four powers. I can, you know, can take off two of them and make them, I mean, I need this in the argument here to take care of my epsilon. You don't see that, I, you know, there's also this epsilon somehow around here that I will see in the expansion. So I will need, you know, an epsilon square here, but these are too many powers. So I can basically distribute it but only because I'm doing my localization here. So this saves the day. I know this was quick, I apologize for, for but at least I wanted to, uh, you know, to show some explicit details here. In turn, I will not torture you with these details here. So, so you can say more about these constants that comes out, but you know, I think you, you earned your, your time off now. There's also some technical issue here that, that uh, that in order to implement that you get to this level here, there's some little bit of anticipating calculus that comes in, but I really don't have time to go into this. So let me just conclude here that in this prototypical rough bus or wall model, excuse me, rough wall model, uh, for small x, you can go a little bit further here and you can, so this, this one I showed you earlier, but you can also, you know, zoom in to this factor here for x small and do all sort of stuff. Um, again, I should not go much further to here. Then if I gave a similar talk here in a final seminar and then uh, these slides here, again, I will treat very quickly. The contribution, I mean, this, this is a story. I have to make a case. All this work, we got this extra term here in the implied wall expansion. Why does it matter? This is why. This is what you do without and the improvement here. And we're looking at really extreme scenarios, very short and very small age. You know, this is what you do without and this is what you do with. And then the picture is getting better if you go a little bit further down, you know, out in time or make your age a little bit bigger. So I'm, I'm really very honest here that I'm showing you the worst case scenario pictures, everything else that's on the paper, there's a whole cascade of beautiful pictures. Oh, here's some of them, okay. Good. Conclusion, rough, mol rough models are an analytically tractable, large deviations, Laplace method, regularity structure, rough paths, they all work together, good. Um, the way I see it is they give you somehow, they give you tools to make heuristic proofs rigorous. And that's, I think, absolutely great. And compared to, well, the CLT base, I'm not going to talk about this and I'm not talking about geometry projections either. But I wanted to talk about a little bit about regulated structures. So until now, 
you know, let's take a view back on this. Remember this one, oh, where are we? Here, this is the this enchilada that we built on top of our noise. And that was the key to robustness. This is the principle of rough bars and regulated structures. So let's formalize this in a bit different way. And so here's an Eto Brown in motion, I mean an Eto integral against Brown motion. Here's our WH. And so let's think of, you know, okay, that's not specific. This H here is chosen such that you the smaller the H, the more building blocks you need. So if you're in a, in a setting of Brown in motion with H equals one half, then that's basically the classical, you know, Terra line setting of, of Brown in motion and rough bars, and it's a level two setting and basically need the iterate integrals, in this case, W, DW, which you can even spell out. So this is it, you wouldn't need anything more, but, but if H is small, then things are bad and you need more, but finitely many, it depends on your H, but it's always finitely many. There's no formal expansion or some, some nonsense. It's finitely many and the rest is analysis. And so how many? Well, if you do, if you do some power counting, in this case here, so when H is 0 0.13, just for the sake of, of concreteness, you would need uh, actually three of them. So this would be the level two, then there's a level three. Again, you should think of this as a building block of the form WH squared DW. And this one would be the integral of WH cubed DW, okay? And there's one here and, uh, okay, okay. Um, okay, I just told you a little bit of a lie here because it's not the integral, it's somehow the distributional derivative of the integral here. So this is not Brown motion, this is white noise. And this is not the integral of fraction Brown motion against dw, but it would be formally whw dot, but we can properly define it using Eto integration, right? It's the distributional derivative of the indefinite Eto integral. So I cannot define all this as the Eto model in this context. And well, 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 so this rough wall structure that emerges here consists of bushy trees. So if H is getting small, I'm growing more and more bushes out there, but I'm not going very deep, which is opposed to geometric rough paths, if you know what that means, where you just, you know, keep, there's no branching in geometric rough paths. You can resolve all branching with shuffle identities. And so you build linear trees or sticks. They can be very long, but there's no branching, okay? So if you want to unify these two, this, then you're in the world of branch rough paths, but the, the downside of the world is it never somehow had, had profound natural examples. So I think this one is a, is a very, very explicit and even useful example that, that we have been somehow exploring. Okay, now, if you, if you are a fan of regulative structures, the second edition of my book with Martin is out. Uh, you know, we wanted to make it short and sweet and we started in, in 17, so it took us, uh, no, maybe 18, it took us uh, two years to, to do it. There's a new section now in the chapter on regulated structures that deals specifically with rough volatility. And so all the co-products and, uh, you know, all the things you have might have seen, you see them again in the context of rough volatility, but as always in this context, introducing all this notation uh, that requires another 20 minutes at least, or if not a talk or a series of lectures in its own right. But I strongly recommend you go there. The second edition is worth the money, 100 extra pages. Now, I don't know how tired you are, but I have 10 more slides to go. Shall we keep going? I think we can go uh, keep going for like five minutes. Okay. Like oh, it's getting a bit messy now. Uh, you know, I turn to a different way of, of looking at so let's talk about single SPDEs. And if, if there's one thing that I would love if you people take away from tonight is that the maths is very similar, okay? So not, I'm not claiming everything is the same in, in regulated structures and finance at all, but, but here is, a, is somehow a, uh, a set of problems that, that require very similar thinking. So it's GPM, which is somehow the, the example 1.1 in singular SPDs. So this form here, it's a two space dimension. And I know it's an SPD seminar. You must have seen this before. And so you do the power counting and, and you realize this product here is not well defined. This is spatial uh, white noise. So no time, just spatial white noise. You do the power counting, blah, blah, blah. 
GPAM in 2D is ill posed. But <clears throat> if you're smart, so if you're smart, you, you do something and it works. And so what you have to do is, as you know, you have to renormalize. And so in that GPAM setting, the renormalization here has the structure here. So it's like, you know, F times F dash, it looks a bit like an Ito, Ito Stratonovich correction term. And so this constant is diverging, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also do this in standard BAM example. So we are on the 2D torus here. Uh, again, if you've never seen this before, this is not the moment you learn about it, but if you have seen before, then you know what I'm talking about. And now here's a very quick recap on how to, to do this with regulated structures. So you define symbols, so the noise becomes your, your Xi and then and then you have the, these, you know, these building blocks like before that come in and now it's not, it's not, you know, WH times W dot, it's, it's K convolution Xi times Xi. And if you think, what was our fraction power motion? Well, it was a convolution of white noise in one dimension with this Riemann liberal kernel. So formally it, it's just the same, the algebra is identical. And the analysis is not so, dif so different either, right? At some point you have to, to know something about the regularity here. So, if, you know, you have to use some sort of shadow estimates or something to, to, to understand what's going on. So it's really not that different. Now, one thing which is different is that we had no spatial component here. And so in regularity structures, you need also these, these guys here. So you put them all together, you're building blocks. I mean, this is how you index them in a nice way. This is what, what they are. And then you have to renormalize this in, in some way. Uh, it's a I mean, we didn't have to talk explicitly about renormalization in our previous, you know, discussion. Rafael, why not? Because we had Ito integration at our disposal. So Ito integration does renormalize for you. Because think about this for a moment. If you go back to, so this is an, I think, an important point I should really make. Let's go here. Look at this guy here. It's it's a classical Ito integral, one dimensional, very easy, one brown in motion. And you use this one brown in motion to cook up this WH, which is, you know, think the convolution of W dot with this Riemann Liouville kernel. Okay? It's an Ito integral. That's important. It's an adapted integral, no problem. It's an Ito integral. If you try to make a Stratonovich, well, I mean, you can, you can try. What would happen? Well, here's some exercise compute the quadratic covariation of these two guys. And you realize quickly just by scaling arguments for h less than a half, the quadratic covariation will diverge. But Ito plus quadratic covariation is Stratonovich. So therefore Stratonovich diverges. There is no Stratonovich at all. So writing down Ito implements renormalization. So that's why you didn't have to do it explicitly. So here you have to do it explicitly. I mean, renormalization here is no big deal. You are in the second chaos, basically you subtract the, the sorry, you're in the second inhomogeneous chaos, you subtract the zero component, the zero chaos constant component, and then it's renormalized. So this is no black magic here. And then you get a model and then you solve it. So here's the picture that you have seen before. You model it, you, you solve it in a space of model distribution that corresponds to, well, controlled rough bars, but let's not talk about this. But Again, here the picture is down here is the noise and you, you, you call it Xi or W, it doesn't matter. You move it to a bigger space. And there you may have to do, I mean, if you modify down here, you may have to do some renormalization up here, but, but analytically speaking from here to over there, that's a nice solution map. It has nice properties. I mean, these spaces are non-linear, you have to be careful, but it's a nice solution theory. And then you can go back here in the rough setting, you don't see this really because you know you. I mean, it's just point evaluation that gets you back, so there's no issue. Here. So it's a general picture. I mean, this is a very impossible crash course on on regularity structures. But hear me out. What happens when you try to follow what you've done so far? So you would also like to understand towards a Laplace method. <clears throat> you want to shift your noise 
by some H that later on in, in your large deviation principle or your Laplace principle is somehow typical. So there's, there may be a unique minimizer later on that gives you some special H. And so you want to shift your noise to do this Gersano, uh, camera martin transform. What happens? Well, here's the fixed point formulation of your SPD, the mild formulation. Um, replace Xi by Xi plus H. What happens? Well, you will see terms popping up of that form, right? Xi, so, so at the, the level of these building blocks, right? We had, where were the building blocks? Here was a building block. K convolution Xi times Xi, that was a building block. And now you perturb, you get these cross guys. It's a bilinear form. You get K convolution Xi times H and then the other way around. <clears throat> so to solve this, this extended problem, it's, it's, it's a lot of bookkeeping involved here. You need somehow to enhance your regularity structures to do that. So you need these additional symbols, et cetera. So, and it's not just, well, it's not just silly bookkeeping. You also have to get the analysis, right? And these uh, H's here, if this is white noise, then the, your H here is in L2, L2 on the two dimensional torus, if you want to be precise. And so in terms of the, the you know, alpha Hölder regularity, I mean, you can put this in the, in the Hölder scale with negative Hölder exponent alpha, you can, you can do all that, but you have to be very careful because in the, I mean, this is just a, a wish list here, what, what you would like. The trouble is that if you want to, uh, to multiply somehow your convolved noise with, with this H here, so, so it's an elliptical problem here, right? So, in, <clears throat> so the abstract integrator here amounts to convolution with the, the heat kernel, so by Shouter, you get you gain two estimates. So if your noise was in alpha and alpha is somehow you know minus one minus that's the regularity of spatial white noise in two dimensions, and you gain two and that's fine and dandy. But then your h here you want to multiply with h is just an L two, and so L two embeds in c minus one in two dimensions. That's not good enough. So you can't just multiply these guys. So you have to go out of the Hilda scale. And so, well, this is a fairly elementary still setting where this can be done. I mean, there's a JFA paper where we did multi-event calculus for, for regularity structures that took a few pages in the appendix. So it's not impossible, but you know, it's also not a triviality. So you can, you can put it together precisely and that's the work you need to do. And then you have somehow this, this camera Martin element plus your white noise, both ready to go as a joint model. So it's the missing plus for the whole problem here. So, okay. By the way, this, this joint lifting here commutes with normalization. There's also a general argument. Um, and, Peter, I think we are uh, already uh, mind, we're already uh, 10 minutes late. I think, uh, can you conclude within the next yes. uh, one or two minutes? I will. I have, I have a th three slides left. I can. So, right. so we started with Laplace methods in this rough wall setting, but now we can follow the same pattern of proof if you think about it for uh, to do a Laplace principle for SPDs. So if Y is now your solution to, to, uh, to PAM, right? I mean, here's so very, very general. If this is a general story about the uh, con contraction principle. So if you have LDP, you get another LDP for Laplace principle, you can write the, <clears throat> the large deviation principle equivalently as a Laplace principle. So this is super well known, okay? Now, if you do this specifically for GPAM, then you know it's just a special example of a continuous map because from the model to the reconstructed solution, you have a continuous map, it's all good. And so now you can follow the, this Laplace method for SPDs by doing the same work on the model space. And so again, you need a few assumptions that you have a unique non degenerate minimizer then you need a bit of regularity and then you have the following meta theorem and here it is, this is the somehow the, I mean, if you just look up here, this would be, you know, Varadan lemma, but this refinement here under these assumptions, that's called the, the uh, Laplace asymptotics and that works. I mean, this is now a very vague, uh, you know, quick uh, glance at the story you can expect that this, this whole machinery putting it all together in this way will work. And indeed it does. I mean, I, 
I shouldn't say this, you know, I, I make it look like now this is this can't be done, this, this is doable. Yes, uh, so there's an 80 page PhD thesis a paper coming from my, from my PhD student, Tom Closer, where this is all done carefully. Uh, there's some all, some references to, to, as I said, their previous works in the rough bar setting where something was done. This is the paper I'm mentioning with my PhD student, Tom Closer. Uh, some other papers that, that are relevant. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you for staying with me for such a long time. Um, I'm done. Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, very nice talk. Do we uh, have questions from the audience? Feel free to just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, maybe I have a question. So when you uh, showed us uh, these uh, pictures, uh, these graphs, um, I, I didn't uh, really uh, see, was that based on a simulation or was that based on actual data? Well, we have a model here. So, you know, we can do a brute force Monte Carlo simulation to get the, the prices and the implied volatilities for that model. So, you know, it could be a different preliminary exercise to take real data and to calibrate that model to real data to make sure that you're not you know, using crazy parameters. So yes, indeed, we took parameters, uh, maybe from this for the Zang paper that they used to calibrate. But, you know, we were not interested here is going out to market data and, and do something. Okay, so but, but you're saying so there is uh, empirical evidence that the curves actually go up as you've shown uh, in, in those graphs. The curves go up. Let me see what you mean. I think that is uh, so. Is this, this yeah, here? so yeah, so how do the recurves look like more like the one that more like the black one or more like the green one so the black one is the the is the precise implied volatility curve that this model implies so if you you know if you take this this for the tsang model um for okay the only question you may have is what what choice of of sigma and delta did i make i mean which parameters do i have at disposal I have sigma, this is a function, which one? So usually people take it exponential and we've also taken the exponential here, it's called Graf-Bergomi. What is h? So h I've given you on that plot and what is rho? I haven't told you, but I think we took minus 0 0.7, but I may not be right. So if you go to the picture here, the h is up here. I haven't told you what, uh, what this function sigma is, but I tell you now it was taken as exponential and then, uh, so sigma from x was exponential of uh, eta x that plays the role of somehow of, of a default parameter. And I don't remember what number we took, but I think we took the one that that uh, Vore Zang had in their calibration. So we're, I mean, if you have looked at any implied ball smiles in real data ever in your life, and I have done it for, for some time at Merrill Lynch, and then this, I mean, this is how they look. SPX okay. is very typical. Okay, uh, great. Downward sloping. I mean, the, the fact that it goes down here has to do with the negative uh, correlation. Okay. okay, thank you. Are there further questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Peter again for this uh, very interesting seminar. Thank you. And then uh, wish you have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Ciao. Okay, bye-bye. See you all.